what will the future of work look like? This seemingly age-old question has taken on increasing importance as many leading experts think that most of our jobs will soon be done by machines. Yet if this is the case, then what would that mean for how humans make their living and how people spend their time? Many future-thinking people have been asking these exact questions for years. Ah, my office, the perfect office. Perspex desk, no in tray, no out tray, no phone, no filing cabinets, no clutter, quiet, cool, very efficient. I need never get out of this chair. That'll be nice, no distractions, just me and the work, alone and efficient. Certainly free to get a lot of work done with no human distractions. Much better than a human being. Tireless and efficient. Anything I want, it brings. Even company. Hey, I'm just off to New York. Before I go, don't get charged. Although it looks funny to us now, they did get a few things right. That video screen looks a bit like Skype, and scanning and sending documents and images is something we do with our printers and smartphones all the time. What I think they got wrong in this clip is that there are no people. I believe that the future is people-led and people-empowered by a new kind of work. The Open University is an institution that's been breaking the mold for years by allowing people to learn new skills in their own time, anywhere in the world. So we've put together a team of experts to try and do a better job of predicting the future. We've done this by talking to people already working in new and creative ways to see if we can pinpoint what the future of work and society may actually look like. Someone who's been at the cutting edge of thinking about the future of humanity and the world is author James Hughes. In his seminal text, Citizen Cyborg, he predicts an exciting future of transhumanism. But what precisely is transhumanism? Well, in the simplest terms, transhumanism is the belief that present and future technology can transform human existence. It looks at the ways in which technology, for both good and bad, can make a real difference in how we live, act, and even conceive ourselves as human beings. How did you begin thinking about the question of technology and politics and its relationship to the future? In the early 2000s, the politics of human enhancement technologies really began to take off. So the, that was the context in which I wrote Citizen Cyborg. And I was really, I was exploring these questions of what a citizenship identity could be in a world that was rapidly uh, becoming more diverse in the forms of intelligent, sentient beings that inhabit it. And then we began to see uh, in the last 18 months the growth of Trumpism, Putinism, Duterte, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and things were happening in the futurist and transhumanist space where people were getting very interested in electoral politics. Um, and I think we're beginning to see uh, not not transhumanism per se, but uh, we're beginning to see the left begin to grapple with some of the issues of the future. You know, here in the in Boston, the socialist uh, uh, youth, the millennials who have all begun to flood into the left organizations, they just, it ripples off their tongue, fully automated luxury communism. Uh, it's just assumed that there's going to be this new paradigm of post-work uh, luxury so at least in those some of those basic political economy issues, I think we're beginning to see the emergence of a new future-informed uh, uh, politics. I would say that there's a much stronger, particularly within the left and particularly within young people, a kind of discussion about are we going to have jobs and do we even want jobs? And I think that is a big movement to, you know, from a post-employment fear to a post-work hope. Um, and that's beginning to happen. But I think going back, one of the kind of questions that I have is that how do you see helping people move from this, from a kind of ideological abstract debate to actually begin thinking about in their own lives what this could concretely mean? If you talk to people now um, and you tell them, 
well, you know, it's possible that we could have technologies in 10, 15 years that stop the aging process and eventually they might even reverse it and that death might become more or less optional at some point in the future. Most people say, oh, that sounds terrible. And what about this? And what about that? And most of that's sour grapes thinking. You know, very few people who are 90 years old commit suicide. Most people, if they're offered an extra couple years of life, will take it. So I think when we get there, they will take it. But the sour grapes is, I don't really believe yet that that is going to be on the table. So I have to reject that and still buy into and affirm a paradigm in which death is good. Uh, and the same thing with uh, a post-work society, that um, as long as people don't believe post-work affluence is possible, then they have to just reject the whole paradigm and say, well, a society of moochers, they'll just all sit in front of their TV. Wouldn't that be terrible? You know? So at some point with all these issues, there's going to be a tipping point where so many people are unemployed or dramatically suddenly in one year lose their jobs because of automation that people begin to say, wait a minute, is there another way to do this? Where some new breakthrough uh, changes the paradigm around aging and people say, oh, maybe there is a Maybe there's a possibility of us all living a long time. Let's start thinking about how that's going to work. Um, and I, I'm, we need to prepare, those of us who have a kind of techno-progressive vision for this, we need to prepare to make sure it goes one way and not another. What do you see as, like you said, tipping point questions around empowerment and technology that are really going to help define a debate and really kind of shape some of the ways in which we're thinking about the future and seeking to you know, transform the future? I've tried to back out of prediction um, because, you know, as long as I've been, my dad got me a subscription to the Futurist magazine when I was like 12. And he took me into his workplace and taught me to learn basic when I was 13 with punch cards because he said, son, computers are the future. You have to know basic. He was right about the computers. He was wrong about the basic. And throughout, you know, uh, 25 years ago, I was sure that we were on the cusp of having anti-aging therapies, pills for obesity, artificial intelligence was around the corner, and so forth. And, you know, all these things take a lot more time than the futurists tend to estimate. I wouldn't try to predict what's going to happen in the next five years. But it's clear that things are changing very rapidly, very chaotically, very uh uh, unexpectedly in the geopolitical uh, domain, uh, that new technologies continue to emerge at an unpredictable rate. We have to sketch them out in the broadest possible way and sketch out the future that we want to create beyond those uh, possibilities, because we just don't know when they're going to come. It might come next week. It might come in 15 years. Whenever it comes, uh, we have to be prepared to ensure that we get to an egalitarian, liberal, uh, and prosperous future. The idea of cyborgs may seem utterly futuristic or even completely fantastical. However, the use of human enhancements is nothing new. It's in effect quite ordinary. Think only of our use of eyeglasses or our prosthetic arms. However, how does this relate to the future of work? The Machines Room is a makerspace in East London where young creative entrepreneurs are trying to build the future of work today. I went along with Cinzia Priola to speak to some of the people working there. Can you tell me a bit more about what, does, um, what Disrupt Disability does? Disrupt Disability started life really as a group of a community of wheelchair users who were really interested in finding out more about wheelchair design and wheelchair manufacturing and wanted to be connected to designers and, and makers. So we're currently in a maker space and there are all sorts of digital fabrication tools and machines around us. So we have uh, 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC mills. So it's very, very user-led and our, our main focus is really on facilitating that so that people can have wheelchairs that are designed for them. We were inspired, or Rachel Wallach, who's the founder of Disrupt Disability, was inspired by an organisation called Enable, who she came across when she was on a trip to, I think, Jordan. They were using 3D printing to support refugees of the Syrian crisis. They showed me a 3D printed prosthetic hand that they'd made for a boy who'd lost his fingers in the conflict. They'd fully customised it to his body, and they'd even made it look like the Ben 10 hand, so it was customised to his preferences. But the total cost? 
It was only $39 to make. Rachel did some research and found out that the reason that they were able to do this was because they were working with a community, an online community of designers who were voluntarily designing um, and contributing their designs for prosthetics and that each of those designs could then be 3D printed. We think that the people who are best placed to understand what they want from a wheelchair and to articulate that are the people who use wheelchairs themselves. So imagine you're trying to climb a mountain, but you're wearing a pair of stilettos and they're three sizes too small. It would be pretty difficult. And that's exactly what it's like to use a wheelchair that hasn't been customised to your body, your lifestyle and your environment. The problem is, with traditional manufacture, customisation is really expensive. So currently, a customised wheelchair costs about £2,000. At the moment, the wheelchair market is very different to, say, the market for glasses. You know, I, I wear glasses because I can't really see very well without them. Um, I go to opticians and I receive a prescription for my glasses. But from that point onwards, the experience of buying a pair of glasses is very much like the experience of buying a pair of shoes. It's, um, it's down to my tastes, it's down to what I want to look like. But wheelchairs, that process is quite medicalised. Somebody is immediately treated in the process of choosing their wheelchair as a disabled person. Whereas in my experience of buying glasses, I have never once been treated as a disabled person. Um, and partly that's because there is not much customization in terms of wheelchairs. Wheelchair design has been quite static. Previously, the only people involved in wheelchair design were medical professionals, engineers, designers, and perhaps a wheelchair user at some point in that process. But the range of people we've been able to involve is much broader. So we've got artists, we've had, uh, we had a locksmith, <laughs> we've had people from an incredibly, incredibly broad range of different disciplines. And I think this kind of creativity is something that we'll start to see more of because distributed manufacture and digital fabrication really enable these kinds of collaborations. Can you tell us a bit more what is digital fabrication and what is distributed manufacturing? Sure, so digital fabrication is kind of what it says on the tin, it's using digital means, so using something like CAD, computer-aided design, to design and then manufacture. Um, distributed manufacturing means that you can manufacture anywhere. You don't have to manufacture in a central location. So as opposed to where traditionally you might have a workshop um, where you're making all your wheelchairs uh, and then you ship those wheelchairs to the customer, we're looking at actually how can we take that manufacturing process much closer to the customer. So how could somebody go to their local makerspace or their local manufacturer and have something made for them? What, where is disrupt disability now? The point we've come to is we've started to look at creating a modular wheelchair system. We realised it's quite difficult for somebody who's never made a wheelchair before to make a whole wheelchair. And also that for the, the user, they might have an element of their chair, for example, the cast of fork, um, so the front, the front wheels, that they might say they need to change it. So for their day-to-day -day life, when they're working in an office in London, um, it, they want something quite small and neat and discreet. But at the weekends, they like going for long walks in the Lake District, and therefore they need something that can handle a rougher terrain. As you would do with a bike. Yeah, as you would do with a bike. So having something that's able to be interchanged is, is a we see as something that could really benefit both the user and the designer and the maker. Could you see uh, this model, mm -hmm. this organisational model, working for other organisations in the present and in the future? Yeah, I think actually it's a really good way to start a business. Um, if you start with your users, your customers, um, the problem that you're trying to solve and really make that very human and then try and build your solutions out of that. Working with Disrupt Disability in the same space is Julian Vasser from Batchworks, another company working to produce personalized products using digital technology. So it's interesting with Batchworks, though, because when people think of production, they either sometimes think of craft work, which is someone making one thing, or they think of mass production, which is yeah. this huge thing. But when I think of batch, I think of almost something that I'm cooking. <laughs> so I'm thinking of batch or something. <laughs> yeah. So what is batch production? Batch. Manufacturing is kind of bridge the gap in between, so it's production that fits the needs of the local and um, 
So yeah, it's, um, it's a low volume production, basically. Yeah. Maybe you could share a little bit about your background, your inspiration for this, and then how you made that inspiration a reality. Yeah. I was working full time as an architect, and, uh, and I, I kind of quickly realized that I wanted to make things, not spending my full time behind a computer. So I've started using my skills in, you know, 3D modeling and CAD drawing and put these kind of skills in the 3D printing. You can have an idea in the morning, prototype it, make it and see if it's viable. So this is really powerful because the design process is, you know, from three months or six months to, you know, one day. Are you actually seeing the fact that more types of people can get into uh, this? So I think this is where, you know, Makerspace and Fab Labs are. I've been created is to kind of do this kind of bridge between, you know, people who are kind of, you know, a bit geeky and know about, you know, 3D printing and woodworking and some people just, you know, pop in and say, right, I just want to make a boat or, you know, it's pretty open. But I think the space make the, you know, the key of that. People talk quite a bit about sustainability in yeah. these aspects, but if we can even look at this uh, lamp project. So this was made from completely recycled material. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit about the process of making that and how this represents a more sustainable form of production. Yeah. So, so the idea was uh, we wanted to make a product, right? We were like, which product to make? And the first thing, let's make a lampshade. And from there, we were like, how can we 3D print and locally make that? So it's, viable, it's a viable product to sell on markets because right now there is no 3D printed product in the market. If you go to John Lewis, there is no 3D printed product. So we started looking for different material, different type of design, and best way to print it so it's quick and it's efficient. Uh, in terms of material, we were looking for something that is interesting for the light as well. So it's not just a spotlight and something that is kind of, you know, a bit useless. So we wanted to use the actual layers of the printers to be interesting for the light. Then we've looked for transparent filaments, which, uh, so we found this company, Dutch company, uh, where they do recycle, that's the only company who, do, who recycle uh, things and turn them into filament, uh, so you can use it on 3D printer. So they send us some samples uh, and basically they shred the bottles, melt it into filament, and we basically uh, use it to print objects. With production, sometimes people feel very outside of it. Either they have no idea how their things are produced and they just buy them, yeah. um, or they feel very much as if when they are making them, that they don't have a lot of control of the process. But this seems a much more personalized and yeah. inclusive form of production. Yeah. It's basically when you use a 3D printer, there is no, almost no waste, right? Which means you print one part at a time, so each part can be personalized. So we did this project of 50 lampshade in Paris. It was the client said we want 25 different design of this 50 lampshade. And, and for us, the printing time was exactly the same because it's doing one at a time. So while it's doing one, you know, the other one is prepared to be printed and then print the other design. So you can, you can change the design. We were the only one able to do that because the, they wanted to do in metal and in specific type of production. But it was just like six months lead time or three months, depending on the technology. So kind of looking forward to this, I mean, would you say that this is in many ways the future of manufacturing? I think we don't have to get rid of, you know, the mass production because, you know, we're all buying everyday mass produced stuff. So it's more about, you know, looking at the local needs and see how we could combine all of these. I think the only limit right now is the technology. So every week there is a new printer, every month there is a new 3D printing technology and, and that's just gonna, you know, in five, 10 years time, then we'll see. But I think it's, we can see the potential right now. Spaces like the machines are empowering contemporary workplaces that allow people to work according to their own needs and their own set of values. However, is that what the future is going to look like as well? Or will it look like a traditional corporation that prioritizes productivity and profit over the needs and desires of individuals and communities? Constance Lene from AltGen has a more optimistic vision of the future. She and other young people have started a cooperative 
that's actually built to help young people build their own cooperatives using digital technology. I think, you know, just the first question we had is, what inspired you to help start this organization? I was working for a very low wage um, because I was a junior designer and I couldn't find any democracy at the workplace. Um, yeah, feeling no sense of agency, no power, no sense of ownership whatsoever. When you mentioned cooperatives to people uh, who perhaps, you know, hadn't heard of them before, I mean... What were some of the things in which you, you know, were able to tell them about what a cooperative is and what makes a cooperative different? In the workers' cooperative, um, all the workers are members, owners and directors of the workplace. So in terms of your sense of agency, you do, you do feel that you have a say over the big decisions that matter to you and to your colleagues. And you don't feel like you're submitting some kind of orders and, and arbitrary decisions from some shareholders that you've never met. So we start from the people in order to organize um, in, in opposition to a workplace where you go and you apply for a job, you come and you have to fit in a box and you have your CV that tries to fit in this box. <laughs> um, here we go the opposite, we go the other way around where we look at who you are and what you can do, what you want to do. So in what ways have you been able to use technology, uh, kind of, I would guess, smart technology, contemporary technology, 21st century technology, um, in order to uh, help uh, spread the cooperatives, uh, particularly with young people? The basis of cooperatives is, is communication and good communication between people. And technology, obviously, helps a lot with communication. It accelerates, it facilitates, it brings transparency, is very agile, and I think it has got, it allows us to um, to move as quickly as we would in terms of our thinking processes. Like, yeah, thanks to the te to technology, we can, we can do things as quickly as we think about them. You're a cooperative who's helping other people establish a cooperative. So are there things in the practices of yourself of learning you know, as a cooperative that you're then able to share the cooperative, so some of your own challenges or some of the own possibilities that you discovered. And can you maybe give some examples of that for people? Yeah, um, well, basically what we did was peer-to-peer -peer learning. And from what we did, we kind of um, drew out some kind of templates and also shared our mistakes. And I think we have to de-learn um, hierarchy and we have to learn how to be in uh, running an organization, a project together in a, more, in a more equal way. And this means loads of work on communication. And it's all about relationship, really. The point you were bringing about having to de-learn a lot of our values, de-learn hierarchy, de-learn kind of authority, that cooperatives actually offer us a space in which to have, on an everyday level, kind of more empowering relationships with each other. And ones that I think are not just a kind of you know, part of the economy, but could be a dominant form of organization for the uh, economy. We are not only, <laughs> we're not consumers anymore, but we are active participants and we are political um, human beings. And I think this is, um, this is very um, exciting to see it happening. So there's a real debate uh, going on at the moment uh, with my cooperators and, and colleagues around the question of, um, for example, um, owning Twitter altogether, if we own Twitter, the question of ownership and uh, the ownership of technology, you know, thinking about the future of the economy is a very, very important question. And cooperatives um, look at this very question of ownership. Milton Keynes is a new town and of course home to the Open University. It's also a place where the future is being trialed and created in real time, right before our very eyes. It's a smart city that soon may be home to driverless cars and a place where citizens are being empowered to use data to transform their lives and their communities.
Enrico Mata is a project director of MK Smart, so I asked him what he thinks our future cities will look like. Actually, I've always been very, very interested at the intersection of technology and people. Mm. So uh, pretty much all my career, even when I was doing my PhD, for example, I was interested in uh, understanding how you could build computers that were able to solve problems uh, like, uh, like people do, uh, as opposed uh, as just having algorithms that are machine-like, but are not human-like. So this intersection between people and technology is really what drives my research. And, and of course, in, in, in the modern world, where technology is now uh, much more ubiquitous than, than it was when, when, when I started my career, uh, I, I will say working in um, at the intersection of technology uh, and, and cities uh, as uh, communities um, is a natural step uh, for, for my research. And, and that's what I really like doing. So how did this become the MK Smart project? And how did this form? And what were some of the driving ideas behind it? Well, we, we, we are very lucky as Open University to be actually physically based in Milton Keynes. And I think we are very lucky, we have a very progressive council that uh, um, uh, looks at uh, this objective of being at the forefront uh, of technology to improve quality of life in the city as one of the key, the key priorities. As a technologist, I know putting together a kind of team to help do this from a technology side might be relatively straightforward. But what kinds of other types of skills did you need and people did you need? And how did you kind of come up with creating a team that wasn't just about technologists, but also had people from the public and kind of the ability to have a, a more inclusive team that dealt with the people side as well as the technology side? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Um, uh, the, the, the history of uh, not just my cities, but the te technology is full of uh, um, failures. Um, due to the fact that uh, um, you only had technologists uh, in the picture and you didn't, didn't have uh, other, uh, other, other profiles, including crucial in the concept of smart city, you need to have citizens. So I think this is really one of the big strengths of MK Smart. The fact is, uh, um, so it's not just a technology-led project, but also is a project where the requirements come from the council and there is a strong input from a variety of stakeholders, uh, industry, council, uh, academia, but also the community. But also, in addition to that, uh, um, you know, we didn't just do season engagement. We didn't just, uh, you know, run a roadshow uh, and told people what we were doing. We say, hey, come, uh, come, come and contribute, come and work with us. And, uh, you know, if you have really cool ideas, let us know. And we might actually help you with re we realize it. And, and indeed, we, I was very happy that we, we helped a number of ideas to, to implementation. That sounds very uh, inspiring and optimistic. But I would also be interested in some of the challenges. I know. For instance, when people think of smart technology, they sometimes think of the really exciting possibilities of it. But then when the nitty gritty comes about it, for instance, around data sharing, <laughs> it becomes a little more complicated. So I'd be interested in some of the concrete challenges you faced in you know, moving forward this kind of smart, empowering agenda, and also some of the ways in which you think there has to be some shifting of how people think, or some myths that might emerge that really have hindered the ability to kind of put this board in the most empowering way possible? A, a key challenge is really to do with uh, data availability and, and the nature of, of data. Uh, when you talk about smart solutions in cities, um, a lot of the time is basically about uh, um, generating and making available data that can improve decision making. But then, of course, when you look at the practical guys, all these data that you're talking about typically belong to uh, many, many different organizations. Very often, uh, uh, you have ideas as well, you, you know, you, if we can get all this data, for example, about energy use, then we can do these clever things that then means everybody wins. You know, we can optimize use of energy. Um, okay, but the data about energy use belong to individual customers. There is a privacy element there. And again, this uh, this tension uh, um, has not been solved uh, o optimally at the moment. Uh, of course, you don't necessarily want. Uh, I certainly don't want uh, all my energy data to <laughs> to be released public so that anybody can can use them and know that those are my energy data. Uh, because uh, um, well, first of all, uh, they are private data, and second, you can infer a lot about my my, my lifestyle and the, the lifestyle of my family simply from looking at the, the energy data. Even you know when we are at home, we are not at home. What role do you see in projects like MK Smart and for technologists to do a similar process with data empowerment and allowing people to understand the possibilities of data? There is a big challenge for for us in being able to develop, uh, for example. Uh, 
uh, data portals, city data portals, which are really accessible, which make uh, I I information uh, um, uh, interesting enough and uh, uh, easy to discover enough that people may say, hey, actually, I, I would like to know what the council is doing in my neighborhood, for example, with respect to road building or, or energy or, or whatever, any, any, other, any other initiative. Um, be, beyond that, I think the, 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 the key approach is really then to come up with dedicated uh, solutions for, for specific things. So, for example, like uh, the RMK portal is, is a very successful portal because it doesn't try to, to do everything. It doesn't try to uh, you know, be a, a portal where you go and find anything that is happening in the council. It's simply a portal to encourage uh, um, crowdsourcing of ideas, debate about the smart city, and allow people uh, to, um, uh, to propose ideas, vote on other people's ideas, and eventually to, to have a debate and to come to some uh, um, agreement about, uh, about priorities. Uh, so essentially, they, they, there is this, uh, I, I would say, this kind of high road and low road. The low road is to have many more portals like IOMK, which just do one thing, but they do really nicely and they engage the community. The high road is also to find uh, better interfaces and better mechanisms to, uh, to allow people uh, um, to make sense of data. Uh, and that's really, of course, really important. Uh, um, not just in Milton Keynes, but you know, for, for, for a healthy democracy in, in, in today's world. As you know, uh, in the past few years, there's been a little bit of a shift towards ir irrationality and <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, um, essentially diminish the value of, of evidence. And, and I think it's really important actually uh, to try and address that by having uh, better solutions to allow people to really uh, see the data about an issue and then make up their mind. Uh, that, that's not an easy challenge. It's clear that we need radical new ideas about how and why we work. To do so, we need to adopt a wider perspective about what the future of society will look like and how we can get there. We had Paul Wally go talk to Duncan Green at Oxfam about how systems thinking can allow us to do just this. Can I just start by asking you to tell me what you see systems thinking as? So in Oxfam, I think systems thinking is about um, pulling back the, the lens on the camera and looking at the whole of the context. So you're saying, OK, we look at, you know, the classic uh, metaphor is we look at teaching the fisherman to fish. Um, and then we now look at um, what's the state of the water in the river? Is it the fishermen or the fisherwomen? What's the state of the care economy in which they are living? Um, who's governing the, the rules on, on the catches? Are they going to have to pay a bribe when they catch some fish and try and sell it? Can they even get it to market? So you zoom out and suddenly you see this much more complex system in which your intervention, your project, is supposed to achieve impact. And unless you think about the whole system, it's quite likely your project will achieve very little. OK, so what kinds of examples can you give me of Oxfam applying systems thinking to projects? Well, often I think Oxfam staff don't consciously apply systems thinking. It's just that the good staff do it naturally. I mean, that's one thing I've noticed. So, for example, in Tanzania, um, DFID came to us and said, we want you to try something different on governance and accountability, getting local government to listen to local villages. And we had this genius kind of local um, uh, program person who said, okay, well, we don't know what to do, so what we'll do is we'll try eight different approaches, everything from street musicians to a radio show to school management committees. And then after, after nine months, we'll sit down with the local communities and local partners and say which ones would work best, and we'll scale those up and we'll close down the ones that are not working so well. So actually, she'd kind of reinvented evolution because she was doing variation, selection, amplification, which is the kind of core process of evolution. And she just worked it out from first principles, which always just amazes me when people come up with this kind of thing. I think stakeholder management's quite an important aspect of uh, systems work, isn't it? Absolutely. So we, we get people to stand back and, you know, typically in, in the aid uh, NGO sector, people ha start off with a very limited sense of stakeholders, you know, the state and the people. 
And then when you start talking to them, they obviously have a much more nuanced understanding and you start unpacking the ecosystem and start thinking, okay, so there are these 20 stakeholders who will affect whether that fishing community can fish. Yeah, one of the things that struck me with a lot of the systems work in this kind of area is how the beneficiaries of some of the aid are treated as an equal stakeholder in many instances. On a good day, okay, I don't want to oversell what Oxfam does or what other NGOs do. There's always a problem that, you know, in many cases we have a clash of accountabilities. So we are accountable upwards to the people who give us the money mm -hmm. and we're accountable downwards to the people we're trying to help. And if those two come into tension, often money talks. So there is always a real tension to try and uh, be accountable to the communities, to have proper consultation, just as in, in, in the research world, you know, it's very easy to say I'm going to have participation of local communities, but there's no budget to go back and then present the findings of the research and you end up just being quite extractive. So there are always these clashes of incentives which, which stop yeah. you doing what you want to do. Yeah, I do think sometimes that there's a, there's a temptation to impose a Western solution on a non-Western situation. Uh, there are temptations in all directions. So, so the one temptation is, I've got this great idea, I'm going to impose it. Mm -hmm. Another one is, oh, everybody knows their own answers, we're just going to uncover the, the richness, which is partly there, but actually people want new ideas and new technologies and new things. So there's a danger of being ro over-romantic and being over-sort of, uh, and being very arrogant. They're, they're, mm -hmm. they're equal. They're not equal, but they're both, they're both risks, I think. Okay. And what about the challenges of implementing this kind of systems work? Do you, do you see many? Oh, lots. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, cha there's external challenges. So, um, you know, you're, we're in a world now where the funders will say, what are you going to do? Um, and they want to know pretty much in advance what you want to do. They want to know what results you're going to get. And then they want you to measure those results and to be able to attribute any improvement to what you did. Now, a lot of that is actually anathema to systems thinking. So if there are multiple feedback loops, numerous stakeholders, everybody interacting with everybody else, A, it's very hard to predict the change, and B, it's very hard to attribute any change to one particular intervention. So you're in a situation where people are asking for the impossible in some cases, um, and that can distort what you do in two ways. One, it means you actually look for the places which are simple, where you can get in, vaccinate some kids, get out again, uh, before the system sort of collapses on you, or you actually just, um, well, lie, to be honest. You, you do complex interventions, you improvise, you surf the tide of events, and then when you report back to head office, you say, no, the project went great, the project went to plan. And yeah, there's been some really interesting anthropological work looking at how aid workers live this double life um, of, of uh, facing out in complex systems and facing back in simple linear systems. And, and doing both at the same time. I think it's a, a monumental waste of effort. And that, that part of the reason I'm publishing and writing and thinking about this is to get people moving to a more engaged uh, approach with systems. Yeah, it changes the style of working and in particular the, the way that things are managed. Yeah, I mean, there's a wonderful book by a woman called Donella Meadows called Thinking in Systems who says we have to learn to dance with the system. So I always tell our staff, that, you know, you need to be fundamentally curious about how the system is changing before you think about what you're going to do. You have to want to dance with the system and then you can think of your own moves a bit. But it's, it's that curiosity and wanting to find the answers that are popping up anyway mm -hmm. um, in the system and build on those rather than think, I am, you know, I'm coming in from the outside with these great ideas and lucky old people, they're going to just absorb them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the worst way to do it. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of the main benefits that you get out of this approach? The main benefits is, if you caricature the old way of doing aid, it was, I'm going to do all my thinking up front, I'm then going to spend three years implementing the plan I came up with through all that thinking, and then at the end of three years I'm going to evaluate. Right? And then typically when you do the evaluation you find that either all or some of it didn't work. So one major benefit is that you realise what's not working much earlier, and you think as you go, and you learn as you go. It's as if, you know, I, if I ride my bicycle across London, and I set out in advance the direction of travel and the velocity at all points for the way I get across London, I'm going to die before I get to the end of the road. Um, you've got to respond to the traffic, the situation, and you adjust. So we're trying to make uh, projects and interventions by organisations like Oxfam smart like riding a bike rather than trying to drive a tank across London.
For young, hungry entrepreneurs, the future of work seems bright indeed. The Internet of Things is going to allow us to do things faster, smarter, and more efficiently. But for the rest of us, the idea of not having a job can seem absolutely terrifying. It raises serious questions about how will I pay my rent? How will I pay my mortgage? How will I even pay for my next meal? Malcolm Tory seems to think he has the answer to these questions. We asked Charles Barthold to go talk to him about his promotion of a citizen's basic income. What is uh, basic income? Um, basic income is a very sim simple idea. It's sometimes called by other names, citizen's income, universal basic income, now sometimes citizen's basic income. They all mean the same thing. They mean an unconditional income for every individual. An unconditional means that it, the amount you get wouldn't depend on your income or your wealth or your employment status or your relationships with anybody else. It would be exactly the same amount of money for everyone of the same age. It could vary with somebody's age, so somebody who's older might get more, somebody who's younger might get less, child will get less, but otherwise it remains entirely unconditional. How, how much uh, um, are we talking about in, uh, in this country, in the UK? Um, that's a very interesting question because um, all kinds of different suggestions have of course been made. Um, the, the research that we've done suggests this. If you had a large citizen's basic income, the tax rates required to pay for it would be quite high. That might not be politically feasible. What we have proved is that a citizen's basic income of £61 a week can be paid for by reducing to zero your, personal, your income tax personal allowance and the lower earnings threshold for national insurance contributions and raising all national insurance contributions to 12%. And income tax rates would only need to rise by 3%. By doing that, we could provide every single working age adult with a citizen's basic income of £61 a week. Why is it important for you? And why is it important in general? After I left university, I worked for two years um, on the public counter in a means-tested benefits office. Um, it was called the Supplementary Benefit Office then, and it was part of what was then called the Department for Health and Social Security. So for two years I was facing um, some quite often angry members of the public and some uh, quite stressed members of staff behind me trying to manage a really difficult means-tested benefit system. And the system was clearly bad for everybody. It was bad for the claimants in front of me, it was bad for people behind me. And at the same time, I realised just how useful child benefit was, because child benefit is, is an unconditional income for every child. It goes to the child's carer, and it just kept on coming for everyone who was in front of me complaining about mistakes in their means tested benefits. And so back then, I'd begun to think, well, why can't we do things generally rather differently? so that it all looks a bit more like child benefit. You, you mentioned implicitly a number of problems connected to administering uh, uh, benefits mm. and that uh, this basic income would, would uh, sort out. But there are probably as well benefits for, for people and not only from the perspective of uh, the govern government. Perhaps you could, oh, you, absolutely. You could mention a few Although things Although administrative this. problems affect the, the claimants of benefits just as much as they affect the government. Um, and the administrative simplicity of a citizen's basic income is one of the most important things about it. Um, it uh, because of its simplicity, you could completely computerise it. So it would start at your birth and it would end at your death. And nothing would need to be done to it between those two points in time. It would just keep on coming. Very unlike our present means tested benefit system, which is complex, it requires constant administration, it requires vast amounts of time and effort being put in by claimants and by the staff administering it. And it, it's full of errors, the error rates are huge, um, and fraud as well, and because fraud uh, can happen within such a means tested benefit system, and sometimes the difference between error and fraud is quite a difficult line to find, because what is simply an error can in, fact, can in fact legally be a fraud. And so 
Both the staff and the public suffer a great deal from the administration of means-tested benefits, and none of that would apply to a citizen's basic income. For 400 years, we've been means-testing benefits, and therefore we, we intuitively believe that if the poor need money, you should give money to the poor, which means that you then take it away from them if they become less poor, which means it's quite difficult for them to earn their way out of poverty. So um, that, that's, that's something that's deeply embedded in our, in our minds. And it means that an, an unconditional income sometimes finds it quite difficult to lodge in our minds as a sensible idea, because it's not something we're used to. It's counterintuitive, giving money to everybody. Because people say, the rich don't need it. Why give it to the rich? The poor need the money. Um, but unfortunately, if you give money just to the poor, it becomes an inefficient means-tested benefit. It is far more sensible to give money to everybody. And then you're taxing the rich more than they're receiving in their citizens' basic income anyway. So what's the problem? Uh, especially if it's very efficient to give everyone the money. But there is still a problem with psychological feasibility. It seems to me that this is connected, this psychological feasibility is related to the fact that uh, we tend to associate income with work, and then this basic income would be huge cultural and perhaps even anthropological change, because mm. then people would have to start realizing that income is not necessarily connected uh, to work. One of the reasons why opinion may start may now be shifting, and it does seem to be, uh, is, is, is that the employment market is becoming much more problematic for more people. And so it's beginning to be understood. How could uh, basic income empower people? How, can it, how could it be an opportunity for people? One of the, the important um, effects of a citizen's basic income would be to increase people's choice, uh, choices. Um, and that is an empowering thing, of course. Um, so, uh, if you've got more choices in the employment market, you might decide that if you're in a couple, one of you will, who, who's currently working full-time may well work part-time. Um, uh, or you may both get part-time jobs instead of one of you getting a full-time job, for instance. You, you would have choices to make. And it's when people have choices that they start to look at what they're doing with their lives. And so, um, yes, you may well find that people with caring responsibilities can put more time into them. You might also find that because your marginal deduction rates have reduced, some people might seek more paid employment. So it could go either way. And the way it went would be actually largely up to you. And so um, what I'm saying is that the choices will be there and it, we may see an increase in voluntary activity in the community. I hope we would. And there will be the op option, the opportunity for that. We may see more people um, putting more effort and time into caring responsibilities in relation to children, older parents, and so on. Um, and there will be people more able to make those choices. With how they make choices, of course, we don't know. It's up to them. That's the whole point of a citizen's basic income. It gives people choices. Technology will play a big part in our future. But I believe that we now have the chance to shape that future by thinking about how we want to work and making sure that it's one where we take the power and challenge the established way companies want us to work. It is up to all of us to help build and design a future that is as open as it is technological, that is as empowered as it is smart. If we don't, we might just find ourselves living in a world tomorrow that is not of our own choosing and one that has moved us rapidly forward technologically, but dramatically backwards as a society. from the Open University. Check out the links on screen now.